Greetings, I'm Silicon Thaumaturgy, and welcome to my Controlnet Deep Dive series. Today, we are going to dive even deeper than ever before, and that is because we are about to cover the depth model in Controlnet, as well as the depth and depth Lares preprocessors. As always, let's start with the basics. Depth mapping is a technique that tries to estimate the distance between the camera and objects within an image. The maps generated by Controlnet use grayscale to represent the distance from the viewer, with white being the closest and black being far in the distance, and the shades of gray representing the area in between. In general, there are a couple of scenarios where depth mapping can struggle to accurately map an image. Doing depth mapping from a top-down perspective doesn't work very well, probably because the particular preprocessors in Controlnet weren't designed for this perspective. Similarly, depth mapping does not work well on abstract artwork because, by being abstract, the evaluated depth will be, of course, arbitrary. Depth mapping can also not distinguish between a mirror and a window, so you'll need to be careful if you have reflections in your picture from water, glass surfaces, or mirrors. If you have partially transparent surfaces like windows or water with visible reflections on the surface, the depth map will detect the reflection and the area passed as separate layers. Finally, depth mapping isn't great at capturing small fine details like hair or leaves. However, this can be partially mitigated by increasing the map size. In many real-world applications, two images from two closely positioned cameras are compared to create the depth map based on the differences between those two images, which is similar to how our own eyes perceive depth. However, in Controlnet, the depth map is generated from a single image, which is referred to as monocular depth estimation. So without being able to compare two slightly different images, how is the mapping performed? Well, I'm glad you asked. The preprocessors used for depth mapping in Controlnet are trained neural nets. Much like Stable Diffusion itself, they can be fine-tuned on different datasets to be either very good at a specific task or to be more flexible. At the time of this video, the depth model has two different preprocessors. The one that is just called depth uses a neural network called Midas, while the other one, called depth Lores, uses, to the surprise of no one, a neural network called Lores. These two preprocessors have different strengths and weaknesses that you should understand so you know which is best for the image you want to map. In general, Minus does a better job at capturing objects closer to the camera, but for further away objects, it loses details rapidly. In contrast, Lorez can struggle with objects a bit closer to the camera, though it does a much better job for objects further away. This is particularly noticeable for details on further away objects like windows and doors on buildings. Additionally, Lorez captures more details overall than Midas does. So does that mean that Lorez is better than Midas and you should always use it? I would say no. As with other control net modules, depth is also a balance between getting the particular composition you want and overfitting your map and getting an ugly mess. If you have too many details in your map, that is going to make it harder to find that balance. In general, if the details you want to capture are relatively close to the camera and you don't care much about the background, Midas is the way to go. On the other hand, if you care about details further away, like having windows on buildings captured accurately, Lorez is a better choice. Lorez is also better for capturing fine details on particular subjects like hair and plants, which Midas really struggles with. Both Midas and Lorez can be used on artwork depictions that are mostly realistic. However, when you get less realistic than anime, like these cartoon cartoons shown here, Midas really starts to struggle, so Lorez is really your only choice in those cases. Finally, let's talk about settings for the preprocessors. Both preprocessors have a slider for map resolution. The resolution here will be applied to the shorter of the two dimensions of the image being mapped. For example, if you take a standard 1920 by 1080 image and map with a resolution of 3D4, the height of the map will be 384 pixels and the width will be 704 pixels. The maximum size of either dimension of the map must be less than 2048 or else you'll get an error. For example, if you tried to map that same image with a resolution of 1200 pixels, you would get an error because the width would be 2133, which is greater than 2048. For the minus preprocessor, increasing the resolution increases the amount of detail captured in the map. However, it also seems to intensify the tendency to focus on objects closer to the camera. For the res, increasing the map size also increases the amount of detail captured in the map, but with no noticeable change on focus. Given that Lorez already has a lot of detail in its maps, you should be careful of increasing the resolution because that will put too much detail in your map. 
the Load Recipe Processor also has two sliders for removing the background and removing near. Removing background takes the darker colors and converts them into a uniform black. A slider represents the percentage of the black-white color scale and not the percentage of the image. This means that an image in an enclosed space like a room will be impacted less by removing the background compared to an image out in the open. However, the same image will be more impacted by removing near. This feature can be useful if you need to use Lorez to capture details on objects far away, but the map has too many details to get a good generation. However, it is a bit finicky and might not be an option for all images. Similarly, the Remove Near slider takes lighter colors and converts them into a uniform white. To me, this does not seem nearly as useful as removing the background, but I guess you could use it to make a window or door really pop. Wow, those preprocessors sure had a lot of depth to them. Next, we're going to cover weight and guidance. Weight along with guidance are the two critical parameters for ControlNet. They both determine how much influence the map has on the resulting image, but in different ways. Guidance can be set between 0 and 1, which determines the fraction of the steps for image generation that have ControlNet used for them. If you have 30 steps and set guidance to 0.5, ControlNet will be used for 15 steps. Even when guidance is set to 0, there is still some impact on the final image compared to an image generation without ControlNet. This means that ControlNet will always be used for at least one step. In contrast, weight can be set between 0 and 2, and that controls how closely the generated image will match the map. If weight is set to 0, you will get an image that is identical to the generation that would occur if ControlNet was not used. Next, let's talk about how guidance impacts the outputs. When Stable Diffusion generates images, it takes random noise and gradually transforms it into an image we can appreciate. During this process, the major details are established first, and then minor details are added later. Because the major details are cemented early on, lowering guidance won't do much until you hit around 0.5, which is 15 steps for my examples. In fact, keeping guidance lower could help integrate awkward details into your picture a bit better, so I prefer to keep it between 0.5 and 0.7 myself. However, there are a couple samplers which do not have the same behavior with regard to guidance. The UniPC sampler output does not change whatsoever regardless of the guidance level used. DPM fast is less impacted by guidance than most samplers as it only starts losing adherence to the map below a guidance of 0.15. Finally, DPM adaptive can be more sensitive to guidance than the other samplers, but this does not seem consistent. For DPM adaptive at 30 steps, guidance can start having an impact as high as 0.7. At this point, you might be asking, what about ancestral samplers like Euler A that add noise back in during image generation? Wouldn't that increase the impact of guidance, especially at high steps? Well, I did testing at high steps, and the only sampler impacted was DPM Adaptive, which became more resistant to guidance at high steps, with guidance only showing an impact at around 0.25. Here is a chart showing how guidance impacts the different samplers. Green means that the map is followed, yellow means that the map is partially followed, and red means that you will get few, if any, details from the map. Compared to guidance, weight has a much more linear and gradual impact on the output. For this reason, I prefer to use weight as my primary variable when filling with control net settings, while keeping guidance between 0.5 and 0.7. The appropriate range for weight is also not impacted by either steps or sampler, which eliminates some of the uncertainty. As weight decreases, adherence to the map is gradually lost. At weights above 0.6, generated images are usually going to have all the major details in the depth map. At weights between 0.5 and 0.6, images start to lose some of the major details from the map. Between 0.5 and 0.35, there is still some resemblance to the map. Finally, between 0.4 and 0.3, the output breaks completely free from the map and there is only a vague resemblance to anything below that. On the other side of the spectrum, setting weight too high can hurt your image quality, which isn't the case for guidance. However, for depth, it isn't quite as bad as, as it is for canning and heat control net modules. If you generate at higher resolutions, overfitting becomes a potential at lower and lower weights, which we will cover in more detail in the next section. Which neatly brings us to the section you've all been waiting for, how to generate images at high resolutions with control net. When using Stable Diffusion by itself, you are mostly restricted to generating images near the relatively small default resolution of 512 or 768 because image composition breaks down and causes subjects to twin or fractalize at high resolutions. From there, 
High-res fix, or image to image, or just plain upscan with earth scan or similar, is required to get high resolution images, and, as we know, using high upscaling ratios with high-res fix can be tricky. Now with ControlNet, generating good looking images at substantially high resolutions is possible. However, generating these high resolutions still does have a couple challenges. The first potential issue is the impact of weight increases as you increase the resolution. If the impact of weight is too large, the image quality will decrease and start to look overfit. Near the base resolutions like 512 or 768, the depth model is pretty robust. Overfitting might occur at weights above 1.5, but it is not likely. When the resolution is doubled to between 1000 and 1500, overfitting can start to show up at weights as low as 1. Finally, near the maximum resolution between 1500 and 2000, overfitting starts to show up at weights as low as 0 0.75, which can make it hard to get your settings just right. Here's a chart showing the recommended ranges for weight. In the gray areas, overfitting to the map can be an issue. Green shows where the map will be followed well, yellow is where there is some resemblance, and red shows where there will be, at best, a vague resemblance. The second potential issue with generated high resolutions is that, as the resolution increases, the image starts to become muddy looking and lose color. Fortunately, there's an easy fix for this. As many of my subscribers already know, Stable Diffusion essentially has a built-in contrast and saturation slider called CFG. Despite community opinion, CFG does not increase accuracy towards the prompt and really just adjusts contrast and saturation. If you want to learn more about CFG, I have a video that goes into detail about the topic. Anyhow, the larger the resolution, the larger your CFG should be. For every multiple of 512, I would recommend increasing CFG by between 3 and 5. For example, if the image resolution is 1024, which is twice 512, I would increase CFG from 7 to between 10 and 12. At an even higher resolution of 2048, which is 4 times larger than 512, I would increase CFG from 7 to between 16 and 22. As you might have noticed from some of the examples, CFG is better at getting contrast back up than it is at restoring colors. To mitigate this, you can adjust your prompt by adding something like grayscale or monochromatic to the negative prompt. Unfortunately, the final problem isn't so easy to handle. That's right, twinning is still a problem even with ControlNet, though it isn't nearly as bad and shows up much later. As resolution increases, the complexity of the image increases just like when generating at larger resolutions normally or using high-res fix with high denoising. This is particularly noticeable for complex subjects like detailed buildings, and extra people also show up a lot. There are two main ways to combat twinning, though neither are foolproof or precise. Higher weights can help avoid twinning at high resolutions, but as we saw, high resolutions also make overfitting occur at lower weights. As the resolution gets higher, it becomes more and more difficult to balance both issues at once. The other way is to be careful with your prompt, so Stable Fusion puts something specific in the image instead of whatever it feels like. Some members of the community have claimed that high-res fix is no longer needed now that we have ControlNet, but I would disagree because 20 like this is still a problem. High-res fix is also good for fixing faces, which is something that ControlNet is known to sometimes struggle with as well. And finally, while generating images at the maximum resolution may seem appealing, I found that Stable Diffusion slows down more at high resolutions than you would expect based solely on resolution. In theory, doubling the resolution should cause image generation to take four times as long because there are four times as many pixels. However, based on my results, doubling the resolution actually takes longer, ranging from six times as long for lower resolutions to almost 20 times as long at the edge of what my GPU is capable of. This means it is more time efficient to search at low scale resolutions for an image you like, then upscale it later, than to simply generate many images at high resolutions. Even taking into account all the issues we just discussed, this is still a huge step forward. Instead of resolution being constrained by the limitations of stable diffusion, we are now constrained by our hardware. I am going to recommend a method for squeezing the highest possible resolution out of control net depth. This isn't the only method, so to be sure to experiment and find out what works best for you. First, find and fine-tune a prompt at close to the base resolution until you get outputs resembling what you want. Before the next step, you will need to determine how large of an image your graphics card can support. To do this, just try larger and larger images until you get an out of VRAM error. My GTX 3090 card has 24GB of VRAM, and the largest resolution I could generate was about 4.8 megapixels, 
which is 2200 by 2200 in a 1 to 1 aspect ratio, or 2800 by 1500 in a 16 to 9 aspect ratio. Next, decide how much upscaling you want to use with high risk fix or image to image, and use that to find the resolution for your initial generation. In my example, 2x upscaling, this was 1088 by 1088 for square images, or 1408 by 768 for 16 to 9 aspect ratio images. Using this resolution, but without high res fix, experiment with the other generation settings like weight, sampler, CFG, and steps to find an image you really like. Once you've found that one, turn on a high res fix or send it to image to image with your settings of choice to generate that beautiful image at maximum resolution. It will be excruciatingly slow, so plan to do something else in the meantime. And that wraps up our deep dive into the Control Net Depth module. I hope you learned everything you want to know about using this amazing tool in the Stable Diffusion arsenal. If you did, please like and subscribe. Also, if you have any burning questions about Stable Diffusion you really want answered, feel free to leave a comment. Till next time.